Well, hello, I'm John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Welcome to our faculty highlight series with the Rady School of Management at the University of California in San Diego. We're exploring the importance of generative AI and its impact on business. And today we're speaking with an expert in the field, Vincent Nice, who's an associate professor of business analytics and marketing at the Rady School of Management. Uh, and incidentally, he is co-director of the Master of Science in Business Analytics program. Now, prior to Rady, uh, Dr. Nice was an assistant professor of marketing at the Kellogg School of Management. At Kellogg, he served as the McManus Research Professor. He won the Sydney Levy Teaching Award for outstanding teaching in an elective course and was recognized by the Marketing Science Institute as part of its Young Scholars Program. At Rady, NICE has been awarded Excellence in Teaching and Most Valuable Professor Awards by students in both the MBA and the MSBA programs. Uh, welcome, Dr. Nice. I, it's uh, wonderful to see a master teacher here. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Happy to be here. I know that scholars love to be published in A journals, uh, but what impresses me the most are uh, scholars who are awarded uh, by their students for a superb teaching in the classroom. So I applaud you on that score. Thank you. Appreciate that. So what attracted you to academia in the first place? I really just wanted to keep learning. Uh, I, I started out with a bachelor's degree and sort of not a really clear idea of exactly what I wanted to do. And I ended up in the marketing in the marketing area. Um, and then I transitioned to do my master's degree in Groningen in the Netherlands. And there I met some of the top scholars in the field I'm currently in, uh, Peter Leiflang, Michel Vedel. And I took their classes and it was just, you know, mind blowing to me. The, the amount of sort of um, uh, rigor and, and modeling and data analysis that you could do within marketing, which traditionally has had this 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 uh, this impression of being more soft and focused on things like, do we have the right colors and logos and things like that, right? But there's a whole other world of quantitative marketing out there, which over the years has gained uh, immense value and, and appreciation. That's, that's really where I and my eyes were open to the possibility of a career after graduation that did not involve working in an organization, in a company, uh, and the opportunity to learn and to continue to focus on the problems that I find personally most interesting. And it happens to be that the problems that I find interesting are often also the problems that my students find interesting. So that, that merges really, really well. Now, were either of your parents academics? Uh, no, neither. No. Oh, wow. Okay. So I so had no idea, honestly, that something like a PhD even existed until... I interacted with some of these folks in my in my master's program. It's like, wait, I can study and learn more and you're going to pay me something for it? Outstanding. <laughs> Sign me up for that. That's right. And, and then I'm assuming that that's a natural outgrowth uh, given your discovery that data is being used to make important marketing decisions. That was a segue into data analytics for you. Is that right? That's right. Yes. I mean, again, those classes that I took were, were eye-opening. I, I enjoyed sort of the strategic aspects of marketing that I learned in my bachelor's degree. Uh, but the quantitative component was more at the spreadsheet level before. Right. And right. there's nothing wrong with spreadsheets. They're great tools, but they're more, they're a little bit stuck in the nineties and the early two thousands. Right. So now we have so much data available and there's so many things that you could do with that. Uh, but you need tools and you need, you need capabilities to understand and how to create data driven decisions. Um, and so that's what I what I started learning when I was in Groningen and have continued into my PhD uh, at the University of, of Leuven. And now, uh, after over 20 years uh, in academia, uh, continue to, to enjoy that tremendously. Now, both marketing and data analytics are very broad fields affecting many different fields of um, business and industry. I wonder what are the big questions that you're trying to answer with your work? Right. So I've always been very interested in, in finding what I would call empirical regular, uh, regularities or empirical generalizations. So we might have a, a theory or a hypothesis developed based on one data set or one particular organization, uh, one set of experiments. And that's really interesting. But what I always wanted to do is use more data. Right? Let's see if we can generalize this across a wider range of, let's say, product categories. Right? Somebody might study orange juice in a supermarket and kind of see how the competitive patterns play out there. 
but there's hundreds of categories just in a plain retail store. And just imagine then a Walmart or, or, a, or a Target or something like that. There's so much going on inside of those, those, uh, those stores and those organizations that we need a broader picture of sort of what's actually happening. And this might be a unique thing. It might be different in different, different settings. I'm trying to generalize patterns across these and see where they hold up and where they don't hold up. Right? So that's, that's sort of been the, the mantra of my research uh, for, for quite a few years. Uh, today, my focus really is more, mo much more applied even to say, well, what can organizations do with generative AI? Uh, this is something that we all saw, it's just about a year ago now, uh, that, that ChatGPT came out as an interface available to the public. And uh, that was, I would say, a similarly eye-opening experience for me in terms of its potential uh, for, for organizations to use. And so that's really where I'm trying to invest all of my energy right now. I'm not as focused on trying to make this into academic papers, but more on how can we learn how to have um, organizations incorporate this into their processes, or in fact, redesign their processes to make generative AI optimally efficient, as well as tapping into the full potential of the human employees. Right. Now, it's early days, but I wonder what you know early impressions you have in terms of its applicability into business. Uh, extremely high. Yeah. Extremely high. So the, the area where, where I uh, operate in business analytics, or we also like to refer to it as data science for business, mm -hmm. we use a lot of the same technologies and tools, but focused on a specific sub area, which is business decision making. Um, and, you know, the, the low hanging fruit that organizations have started to look into are things like text generation, right, which is something all of us that have used ChatGPT or, or similar tools have found to be quite useful. Hey, I need to write an email about this or that. Create a draft for me, please. And so extending that into areas like for a company local here in uh, in, San Diego, in the San Diego area, uh, they're using it to help them develop manuals, which could be hundreds of pages of text that need to be formatted in very specific mm -hmm. ways, language in very specific ways. And so automating some of those components. Uh, another company like Stitch Fix, where they're using, instead of content creators, content reviewers, where the content is created, which could be product descriptions, which could be marketing, uh, marketing text, marketing copy. And instead of the initial people, the, the initial creation being by humans, it's the uh, humans that evaluate afterwards what the quality is. Right? And so that's a, that's a difference in, uh, in approach. And I think that's going to be extended to pretty much as far as I can see all areas of business. So we're, we're all going to have a 24-7 tutor available to us. So we can do much more. And where I think the main impact is going to be is once we start changing business processes to focus on maximizing the value of humans and leaving the boring stuff, if you will, to AI to help us with. Very true. And of course, we're looking at a very early uh iterations of uh, ai i would imagine that three years from now five years from now these tools are going to be even more rigorous and more evolved in ways that can do a lot more and a lot more efficiently right. Right? i mean it's, it's been a wave and and that wave is only going to be amplified uh, i i don't see anything stopping this at this point yes there's lots of lawsuits around uh, trademarks and copyright and things like that but um, i don't think there's any going back from this now, you yourself have developed a tool called Radiant, which I guess is an open source platform for business analytics. Tell That's us right. a little bit about it and how it's used. Sure. Um, so I had been using different types of tools in some of my classes. Uh, I'm teaching an MBA program at that point. So Radiant now has multiple different programs, uh, Master of Professional Accounting, Master of Finance, Master of Science in Business Analytics. But we started with our MBA program. And even when I was at the Kellogg Business School, it was always challenging to figure out what's a tool that our students can use where it has all the power of the open source tool, tool uh, chains that are out there, um, mm -hmm. but would also allow students to be able to take those skills that they learned with them when they go to a new, new organization. Uh, and that can be challenging, right? So for example, take SaaS. SaaS was for the longest time an incredibly powerful platform for data analysis. It did things that others couldn't, but their licensing restrictions are very, um, Strong, let's put it that way. And so basically, as soon as you graduate, they'll, you'll get a letter from SAS saying something along the lines of, you must now remove all that software from your laptop. And if you go to a new organization that doesn't want to pay the thousands of dollars for licensing fees, you basically can't even revisit the stuff that you did uh, while you were in a, in a program, in a master's program like ours. So I wanted to give students access to the power of R and Python, but it's an MBA program. 
And so are you really going to spend two, three courses just to get them comfortable with programming and then build on top of that? I mean, that's generally not what a, what a, uh, a, a well-balanced MBA program is about. Right? There's mm-hmm. so many things to learn about, about leadership, about finance, about accounting, about operations. There's not really time to build in just that unless you're consistently going to use it. Because programming very much is a skill where if you don't keep up with it, it's going to degrade very fast. Now, I still wanted to give students access to the code because the code creates a reproducible um, analysis output. Right, so you can you can do it again and again. Somebody can review exactly the steps that you went through instead of manually doing kind of copy and paste work and manual editing of data. And so I created a tool that is a, a web interface uh, based on top of R. And uh, basically what it does is it allows you to basically do any type of analysis that you would want to do with data, but generate the code for you automatically. Huh. So Give if you want to extend that with R or yeah. Python code, you can do that, but it is not required. You can do an awful lot with the incredibly powerful tool chains that are part of Python and R uh, just by using a web interface and have it create the code for you. So give me an example of how ready students are using it. So as an example, when they start out uh, in the program, they get a class on quantitative analysis slash business analytics, and they're introduced to things like hypothesis testing, right? So is this market, how, does it have a higher level of demand than that market? Right? Is there a significant difference between the two? And so there's a statistical test that you can apply to that, but sort of doing that from the ground up with code is, is mm. cumbersome. Right. I have a video that I can share with you, if you like, that shows the difference between what programming is like in the movies versus in real life. Uh, <laughs> and it, it's, it's quite an interesting contrast. I show my students this in class as well. Um, some of them think that they want to learn programming, but when they get into it, they're like, yeah, maybe not so much. There's lots of other things that I want to do with my MBA rather than spend a lot of time with the code. Um, and so they basically go through all the, all the elements of that class. Uh, with the support of this tool, right? It already knows exactly how to do this, what types of output they need uh, to be able to evaluate their analysis. And so it's it's a very a shallow learning curve, if you will, to get started from, I understand what I'm trying to do, for example, this market or that market to enter. And now I've got a tool that's going to help me visualize, summarize, uh, and and do the analysis that I want. Right. Okay, and so that's a that's a that's a significantly shallower learning curve, and it's open source, meaning that they can take it to their organizations after they graduate. Oh wow! So they're that's... free to use it in any way that they like. Uh, now, if their organization uses some other tool, that's fine too. At least they have access to everything that they learned within our school, within our programs. And so there's about ten or eleven classes that use this as part of the curriculum, both in graduate and undergraduate. Uh, it's used at different schools uh, around the U.S. and around the world, uh, and so that's been quite quite rewarding. Now, there's some people who would say that business analytics or data analytics is no different uh, than a term that has been used in academia for many years, data science. Mm -hmm. Are you among them? Or do you think there's a difference between what we would call data science and what we would call data analytics? Oh, those. Oh, no, I don't. I think I think they're used pretty much interchangeably. Right. Yes. So so tell me. Why, why is data science or why is data analytics so critical for business today? Okay. Um, so another term that I wanted to add into this, this discussion would be business analytics, right? And so people yes. trying to make a differentiation Absolutely. between those, those three. And I'd say business analytics is just data science, but then specifically focused on a business application, right? And so this is just, a, just an extension of something that we've seen more and more in, in organizations in areas where... Previously, data might not have been as widely available. Is mm-hmm. how do we quantify and ensure that we have a data-driven decision-making process, right? So one of the areas that's gaining ground in that space right now is uh, human resources, right? So evaluating people on their performance, figuring out who the next best promotion should go to, who we should hire, those types of things. Now, marketing has been following finance for a long time. Right. So finance and economics were already very strong in analytics, and then marketing was the softer discipline within business. And we've basically grown and grown and grown that component until now it's a full-fledged element. Uh, you, you can't go into a management position in marketing without a very strong understanding of analytics. And, and the basic idea is simply this. Uh, you can't make decisions or you can't just um, talk about a decision without having support. Why does this make sense? And that could be something based on data that already exists. It could be based on an experiment. Uh, so one of our one of our top classes uh, in the current era, even with the advent of generative AI, is experiments and firms. 
So that's one of the fastest areas of analytics within organizations. Uh, we've got prior evidence, we've got prior data, we've got our understanding of theories and how businesses compete and and, um, and have relationships with their with their supply chain. But will this actually work? And so an experiment is the best way to do that. And so we've got lots of people in our programs with technical backgrounds that have done experiments in labs and are saying, hey, wait, we can apply some of those same tools and techniques that we learned about from a technical uh, life sciences background into business. And the answer is yes. I think of any major uh, organization that's that has a big web presence, they're all running experiments constantly to try to see if we make this change, if we pull this lever, will that lead to the outcome that we anticipate? Right. And so that's a fantastic combination with all yeah. the resources in analytics and generative AI to have this sort of final arbiter of whether or not we should do something, be an experiment, which is the best way to get at a causal uh, a causal relationship and a real understanding of what your actions will or won't achieve. And all of this is a function of the overwhelming amount of data that that organizations are gathering on people today, right? That's right. That's right. The, the more data we have, the better predictions we can make. And the more we can tune products, offerings, messaging um, to, to what customers want. The idea of, of marketing as being a, a tool to generate demand, I think is kind of um, outdated. The idea is to create value, uh, create value for your customers, create value for your partners and create value for your organization. And so that's really what I think data and data analytics is all about is finding better ways to, to disentangle where we can create the most value for our entire uh, our entire organization and the people that we interact with. How do you teach this to graduate business students? It's challenging. I've I've been doing this for over 20 years. And when I started out, I have actually in one of my slides for my, my introductory, sort of what my students looked like, their facial expressions when, when they first started taking my classes. <laughs> and they were not happy. They were not happy for two reasons. One is I wasn't a very good teacher at the time. Uh, and the other was they thought that analytics was something for an analyst to do. That would be a separate person right. that would take care of all of that quantitative analysis for them. And, and those days are, are long gone. Now, I got a little better as an educator over time. Uh, and, and I've gotten better at sort of explaining what's the value of this and what's the importance of this. Saying, this is the problem. This is data we have available. How do we make a data-driven decision? And then so, slowly building up to, okay, with these tools, they can help us to inform, should we do A, B, or C? Right. So I've always been more interested in sort of a top-down approach where you say, Let's look at the big picture. What are we trying to achieve? And then let's bring in tools and technologies as needed to help us. If none of them are needed, fine. Uh, if they are needed, then we can do that. Uh, programming, as I was alluding to earlier, is more of the bottom-up approach, right? Let's do lots and lots of technical stuff. And after months and months, you might be able to do something fun with it and something interesting, something you actually came to business school for. And some of my colleagues do it that way. And, and, I, and I applaud them for still doing you know, a good job in the classroom. But I've always been more interested in trying to get students hooked as quickly as possible on the importance of what we're doing and then get them to sort of play around and really get their hands in um, and have a have an immersive learning experience so that they can really take what they learn for our, for our part-time students, for example, directly into their organization, as in literally start to apply it the next day, what they learned in class the evening before. The other thing I'm thinking is that um, the ability to leverage and analyze data is crucial to being able to persuade others of your opinion, because yeah. that, that translates opinion that's based on fact and analysis. Mm -hmm as opposed to the opinion that's based on gut. Yeah. I, that's not to say that that your that your gut or your instincts should be should always be ignored. I'm not trying to suggest that at all. I think they are they are should be great partners. But to give you an example, um BCG uh, recently did a large scale study where how, uh, how they they selected a series of their consultants and half of that set got access to generative AI and half of them did not. And what did they find? Uh, the ones that got access to generative AI completed more tasks, completed them more quickly, and the quality level was on average about 40% higher. Wow. So basically these, these tools are available in, and, and useful in so many different areas that what we're trying to do is ensure that not only can they do the work, they can explain the work, they can communicate. Right? So this is what you were, I think, getting to, which is yes. I could get ChatGPT to create a whole business plan for me. But ultimately, I'm going to have to get up in front of my board, in front of my managers, and explain why this actually makes sense, right? And they're going to ask me questions. And I don't have ChatGPT at the ready at that point to say, hey, what should I say to this question? 
right? So you really need to have a deep understanding of what you're doing and what you're using or leveraging generative AI for, uh, which is why we think of it as a, as a sort of a skill multiplier. If you have no skill, generative AI is basically multiplying by zero, right? You're not getting anything out of it other than, um, you know, a set of slides, but you have no ability to convince people about the value of what you're suggesting. How far along do you think business is in uh, basically adopting uh, generative AI uh, for its processes, its operations? Um, more limited than I had expected so far. And I think part of that is just you know, anything new, especially in larger organizations, is going to face some type of inertia. So there are definitely organizations that are starting. Uh, there are those that are allowing their employees to take advantage of generative AI with caveats, like make sure you don't put company data uh, into, into the, the tool because it could end up using that and, and learning from that. Um, but things like the enterprise, uh, enterprise uh, license that OpenAI is now offering handles a lot of the security aspects and so this is going to be the opportunity for organizations to see, well, how far can we leverage this? And I think the main, the main thing to do here is don't try to transform your organization into an AI-assisted organization in one fell swoop. Start with something small. Pick an area where you've got issues. Pick an area where you have people willing to participate. Analyze that break it down into tasks, figure out how humans can be best supported by AI, and then build on that. That's a small win that you can then leverage throughout the organization. Uh, I'd say everybody's talking about it. Right. I think if, if an organization is not currently actively talking about this, they're, they're, in, they're in trouble, but they need help. They need help from our graduates. Uh, they need help from consultants. If there's one area that I see growing a tremendously uh, in the next few years, it's consulting. Uh, they, are, they are getting training, they are experimenting, they're trying to figure out how do we help our customers leverage these tools? Because we've, it's, it's sort of like the, uh, the advent of um, automation in production of, let's say, cars. Right? Maybe before it was five or six people tooling on a, on a single car, then, maybe, then, then it became a, uh, an assembly line. Now, I don't think that's where we're going to go, but we're going to try to figure out what pieces of a particular set of tasks can we outsource and which parts can we really leverage humans' ingenuity and creativity uh, and drive uh, to really complement that. And I think that's something that very few companies are currently doing yet, but that's that's the next stage. The, cur the first stage is let's incorporate it as, as much as we can throughout our organization. And then let's see how we can redesign particular operations, particular processes uh, to really fully leverage it. So giving students the ability to uh, learn how to use Gen uh, AI and employ it in the work uh, world is obviously a big advantage for ready graduates. Correct, correct, yes. So our, our program is very much hands-on. We're STEM designated, uh, which means that there, there's a, a strong analytical component by getting our students to use these tools for all the cases and exercises and projects that they're working on within our school environment. So it's a safe environment, right? They're not going to get fired if they make a mistake. They're going to be able to learn from their, their experiences here and then leverage those as they go back out into the workforce. So we're giving them a real real chance to really apply these tools and technologies in um, real world cases, real world data, and then again, leverage that when they, when they join the workforce again. So how are you integrating this topic into the curriculum? Right. So, so the first thing that, that I think is a mistake is to try to lecture about generative AI. Sure, you can give examples, you can show how things can be done, but ultimately the main thing that our students need is an ability to have a, an effective dialogue, right? So it's not like a computer program in that sense, right? A computer program, you tell, just tell it exactly what you want it to do. But here it should be a sort of a back and forth. And some people have um, compared generative AI like ChatGPT to a, a relatively inexperienced intern, mm. right? So you can ask them things, you can get them to work on stuff and then say, that's interesting, but I want more of this. Or why did you do that, right? So you can really have a dialogue with it. And once you learn that that's the way to get the most value out of it, in a business context or a context that you're familiar with, that I think is gonna be the starting point where you're gonna start to use it everywhere, right? For your hobbies, for, you know, you, let's say you like to do, to cook or, or to, to, you know, um, uh, maintain motorcycles or whatever it might be. Uh, it can help you in pretty much any aspect of your life. And so once you figure out for one thing, how it can help you, you can leverage that across many different areas. 
So right. again, I don't think it's a lecture-based approach. It's the hands-on approach, seeing where it fails and then talking to others. Hey, I wasn't able to get much useful information out of it. How did you do this? All right. So we want to have in our classroom, how did you use it? Where did it fall short? Why do you think that is? Uh, there's more and more add-ons being added to ChatGPT, for example, the data analysis module, which makes it incredibly easy to get it to do sophisticated calculations, data analysis, graphing, whatever you want. Uh, but again, it's still that inexperienced intern. Right? It can make lots of mistakes. It can hallucinate. Uh, it can give you suggestions that might be unethical. So we still need a really well-rounded um, a business graduate or, or finance graduate to be able to to, uh, to wrangle that in, to sort of rope that in and say, let's figure out how we get the most value out of this. So again, not a lecture-based approach, but a very much hands-on active learning approach. Right. And I know you've already integrated this into your business analytics uh, master's program. Yes. Or full-time in Flex. Uh, and in your uh, MBA program, there is a digital disruption class where I'm assuming that a good portion of the class is devoted to generative AI as well, right? Uh, correct. So uh, you know, there's there's a, there's a lot of low hanging fruit in the area of business analytics, but also in finance and, and accounting. Uh, the MBA is a, is a much larger program in some sense with many more different electives. And so integrating it into that consistently is more work. It's going to take us a bit more time. But um, as an example, the digital disruption course, uh, it is uh, to be used there as a tool to create, let's say, a new uh, a new business model, right? a, a way of operating in a particular market, competing and creating value for customers. And the instructor there said, I'm going to try to use ChatGPT and other open uh, generative AI tools to create a, um, a deliverable, a, a project report, similar to what I asked my students to do in previous classes. And after about half an hour of working with it, he created a, a report that would have gotten in his previous versions of classes about an A minus. Hmm. Right. Wow. So obviously he's the instructor, so he really understands the process. So it would have taken students longer, but basically that sets a new baseline. Right. The A minus is the baseline now. So if a student is not able to produce something at a higher quality level than that, they're looking at a C or a D. So our goal with this is instead of a, a regular MBA or a regular data scientist or business analyst, we're trying to create the 2X MBA, the, the 2X business analyst, the 2X accountant. Right, somebody that when they come into an organization it is able to create twice the value of a standard uh, accountant or standard graduate coming out of a master of professional accountancy program. Now, I think that's a lofty goal, and I think we still have a long way to go before we actually achieve that. But I think we've got we've made the right start. Um, and again, I think we can create so much more value for our students uh, and for the companies that are employ our students that I think we're really on the right track. Yeah. Now, I've talked to professors all over the world about this, and in the earliest days, they were talking about eliminating it, preventing students from using it, even going back to old um, uh, pencil and paper tests uh, to avoid uh, the use of Gen AI. And it's kind of come full circle where if you don't embrace it, that's a problem, right? I would agree. I would agree. Now- yeah. Just to, to there's, it's not necessarily wrong to have a pencil and paper test at the end, right? Because there are certain things that we want our students to understand and make sure that they know. If they can only do what ChatGPT tells them, then again, I think they're, they, they haven't used it as a multiplier. They need to develop skills as well. So there are things we're going to have to do to make sure that they actually learn the things that are important so that they can use it as a skill multiplier. But where I'm, I'm most disappointed is in hearing people say something like, I don't care what they use. The end exam is what has always been. And I'm just going to use paper and pencil, right? That takes care of all my problems. Because yeah. the main thing that they're leaving on the table there is this opportunity to increase expectations, right? To make that 2X MBA, if you will, right? And so they're, they're, they're basically setting their, their students up for failure. There's a really nice quote that I like, which is AI may not replace you, uh, but uh, someone using generative AI might. <laughs> and I don't think that might is even good anymore. They will, right? Yeah. They will replace you. So if you're not able to leverage that, then your your job security is potentially in trouble. Now you referenced this earlier and I want to come back to it. And this is, involves ethics mm -hmm. and how one uses this new technology in a responsible way. And, and I wonder, you know, how, how do you teach students to do that? That is a, a non-trivial task. Uh, we have people with a lot of experience in the area of, of ethics, both at, at Radian and outside. So 
I think there's two components here. One is that we have to make sure that students produce work that they have confirmed, that it's accurate, that it is relevant. Right? You might have heard the story about the lawyer that presented a case uh, where he cited uh, case case law that didn't exist, that was hallucinated by ChatGPT. Right. So those are things that, of course, our students must not do. And so ways in which we can address that or sort of ensure that they're learning the way we want is to literally cold call on them. You just submitted this report or you just submitted this analysis for your class. Tell me how you came to that conclusion. How mm. did you decide on this? What does this mean? Right. So did they really go through the work that they created, co-created or AI assisted uh, at work? And do they understand what they're talking about? Can they extend that? Right. If I introduce new information, are they able to make the leap to say, oh, with that information, we would have done the following. Right. And so that's, I think, one component. Uh, the component of are the actions that we take ethical or not, given that we've been using generative AI as our as one of our sources of input, I think that's not really different from, from ethical business as it's always been. Right. So when companies do things that we find unethical, um, you know, environmental damage, whatever it might be, that hasn't changed. Right. What I am concerned about, especially longer term, is, is what are the what are the implications for employment? Right. So I'm from the Netherlands and, and within Europe, I think there's a there's a distinct possibility that uh, generative AI could lead to something like the four day work week in the US. I'm not sure how that that's going to work out. My guess is it's going to be, oh, you can now do more in 40, 60 hours. Let's do more in 40, 60 hours. Um, yeah. Nothing wrong with that. But but that's, you know, different different cultures and different work cultures are going to going to use this differently. But again, I think the. The, the ethical component of this is, is a huge one, a really complicated one. Uh, we try to infuse that in all of our courses to th have our students think about whether or not you know, actions are, are appropriate, yes or no. And again, I don't think that changes fundamentally with the advent of new tools to help you do research, to do analysis. Now, you referred to generative AI as a potential skill multiplier or a skill extender. Right. And I wonder if you might just give us a little more insight into what you mean by those terms. Sure, sure. Yeah, so so um, as I said, imagine that lawyer that was trying to build his case in court based on output from generative AI. Um, they're going to fail miserably. In fact, I did, they, they, they did fail miserably because they didn't really understand the arguments that were being used and the basis on which they were formed. And so the same thing applies in business. If I am asked by my CEO or my board to come up and present why we should engage with this new business model, and I can just parrot what ChatGPT told me, I can't respond effectively and efficiently to questions. I can't provide additional arguments. I can't change to, to you know, new information, new data, uh, new financial disclosures. Then, then I'm not going to be able to fulfill what I what I want. I'm not going to be able to take the steps uh, and and move my organizations in the directions right. I want. Right. So you need the skills to be able to evaluate the output you get from generative AI to ask the right questions to have that effective dialogue. Right. So that's where I say, if you're thinking of it as a skill multiplier, you have no skill. You're multiplying by zero. Right. You're not getting anything out of it. That's that's really valuable and that can can engage others and get them to to work together towards a joint vision. Now the uh, skill extender component is you have a particular set of skills, things that you're comfortable with, things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? If I do my work as, a, as an educator, as a researcher, I'm very comfortable with those things. I do those all the time. I'm quick and efficient at that. And generative AI can help me uh, in some areas, but you know that's that's not not the main area where I where I use it. Although I use it there as well. It's in things that I want that I would otherwise have to go to somebody else for or hire somebody else for, that now I can say, you know what? I don't usually do a lot with sort of network programming, right? In my particular case, right? I use Radiant and now I do need some network programming to make something easier accessible to my students. Now I can sort of get a, uh, you know, to use some programming parlance, a hello world of how that networking thing might work. And then I can get started, right? So it helps me take a step over, over the over the pond or over the bridge, if you will, so that I can get a foothold and then I can build on top of that, again, with the help of generative AI. So I can extend outside of my traditional boundaries. And so I expect that lots of jobs in the future will have broader boundaries because they will be able to supervise more skills, more tasks that are, are supported by generative AI. Right? So at a high level, again, maximizing human potential, minimizing the amount of drudgery, uh, that's, I think, where we're going. And that means fewer sort of pigeonholed, small, specific task-based 
uh, jobs and more higher level, uh, broader, uh, broader, broader sets of, of job descriptions. Great. Well, Dr. Nice, I, I hope that that's absolutely true, that it does remove the drudgery from our lives and that we're able to focus on more high value and more meaningful mm -hmm. work and actually more fulfilling work for that matter. Exactly. exactly. Um, but that also means collaborating with algorithms and machines uh, as well as you collaborate with your teammates, probably. Right, right. And yeah, you need both, right? If you're only collaborating with generative AI, then again, unless you're doing it all on your own, you're going to need people to work with. You're going to need to motivate people. You're going to need to get them on the same page with you, right? And so communication in some ways is going to become even more important than it's been in the past, right? True. Dr. Nice, it's been a pleasure. Absolutely, John. Thank you very much. All right. This is John Byrne with Quotes of Quants. You've been watching our faculty highlight series with the Rady School of Management at the University of California in San Diego. Our speaker today was Vincent Nice, who's an associate professor of business analytics and marketing at the Rady School. Uh, thanks for tuning in.